Welcome everyone. In place of our mesothelioma and lung cancer study day, uh, we're hosting a series of short webinars, which we hope you'll find informative. Today I'm joined by Professor Cookson, who is a professor of genomic medicine at the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial College London. And he's also the centre director for the National Centre for Mesothelioma Research. Today he's going to talk to us about genetics, genomics and new pathways for mesothelioma care. So over to you, Professor Cookson. Uh, th thank, thank you, Annabelle, uh, very much for the introduction. I'll just start the screen sharing. So I'm director of the National Centre for Mesothelioma Research, uh, which was founded about four years ago with direct funding from the Department of Health. Uh, and our remit is to try and pull together research across different areas into the basic uh, mechanisms driving a malignant mesothelioma. And the main tool that we've been using as Annabelle said, uh, is uh, genetics uh, and, and, and genomics. So, so mesothelioma is a disease of the pleura. The pleura is, forms the lining of the insides of the chest wall, and its main reason for being there is to allow the lungs to move up and down against the wall freely uh, as we breathe. Uh, an important defense mechanism uh, for this space uh, is fibrosis and uh, in infections or foreign bodies that happen to find their way uh, into the pleura. Uh, the normal reaction is to wall them off. Uh, and that's very important when we come to uh, what's going on uh, with mesothelioma and, and the way it causes disease uh, and symptoms. Mesothelioma, as many of you know, is an aggressive and incurable tumour. It's caused nearly always by previous exposure to asbestos. Uh, it arises from the mesothelial, the lining cells of the pleura or the peritoneum, uh, and is hardly ever seen uh, elsewhere. Most of the time, it arises in the pleural space. Uh, uh, about 10% of the time, it may also arise uh, in the peritoneum. Uh, it appears between 20 and 50 years after exposure to asbestos, which is why it's still a problem today, even though uh, industrial exposure or workplace exposure to asbestos is now far better controlled uh, in the UK uh, than it was in the past. Different kinds of asbestos carry different kinds of risks, uh, and blue asbestos, uh, so-called uh, chrysidolite, uh, is, is the worst offender. And one of the reasons for that is uh, that it doesn't dissolve even after years in the body. Uh, mesothelioma was first recognized in South Africa by Chris Wagner, who saw these strange tumors arising in people who were working in the asbestos mines. Uh, and this is what asbestos uh, looks like. Uh, it's its desirable properties are that it's fibrous uh, and it's a very good insulator, which is why it was mined uh, and used so commonly in so many surroundings. Uh, this is the Wittenoom mine in Western Australia. Uh, and I worked in uh, Western Australia as a senior registrar. Uh, and I used to look after patients, usually or often quite young men who had worked at this mine uh, which is one of the worst uh, episodes of in, in, in industrial uh, lack of hygiene uh, uh, in, in history. Uh, asbestos causes damage uh, in a number of different ways, but it induces inflammation, it induces uh, fibrosis. But the reason it becomes uh, causes cancer is because uh, directly attacks uh, the DNA. It causes reactive oxygen species, highly polar molecules, which uh, interact with the DNA uh, and cause it to break. So DNA breakage and repair or partial repair uh, are cardinal features of, of, of the pathogenesis of the disease. Mesothelioma grows within the chest wall. It starts very small. It grows very slowly uh, but remorselessly uh, until it becomes large enough uh, to cause symptoms. 
uh, and it's made up mostly of fibrous cells uh, with between 10 and 70 percent of tumor cells within the fibrous tissue and it's the fibrous cells uh, which cause a lot of the pain and shortness of breath. This shows the age distribution uh, of mesothelioma uh, in the UK. You can see uh, that now uh, the peak incidence uh, is in the 70s but also there are significant numbers of cases uh, in, in, in people who are still uh, at working age uh, and with reasonable life expectancies and indeed working life uh, ahead of them. There are 2,700 cases each year in the UK. Uh, there are about the same number of deaths uh, each year uh, and over the whole world there are about 38,000 deaths. Uh, in many uh, countries in the developing world asbestos is still used uh, and is still poorly controlled and so the problem of mesothelioma uh, is not going to go away uh, in the global context. Treatment uh, really doesn't make much difference. Um, this, is, this slide's got a lot of information on it but if uh, these, are, these are the typical survival curves and you can see the median survival uh, is 10 months uh, and advances in therapy uh, really haven't altered that uh, terrible uh, outcome very much at all. People have looked at the genetics of, of many different cancers and indeed for many different cancers the genetics have transformed understanding of the disease and how to treat it. Uh, and this is a list of, uh, of, of cancers uh, with the number of targets that have come out uh, from, uh, from genetic studies. And you can see the mesothelioma is bottom of the list, and that's because it hasn't been studied very much. Just a bit of context about sequencing the genome. There are about 3 million base pairs in the genome. Uh, and if you think of it in terms of a book, that's 1,500 copies of War and Peace, which is a stack of books 30 stories high. The sequencing involves tearing up all of those uh, pages into fragments about 250 letters long uh, and then putting them together again uh, and then uh, working out uh, where in that huge amount of information uh, a couple of letters uh, have changed somewhere between one version of the book and the next. So the, uh, the, the bioinformatics is called the, the, the analysis of, of genetic data uh, is, is, is very complex indeed. Uh, even for uh, uh, experts in the field. It's, it's far from, from, from simple. We've looked at 120 patients, uh, and we've also looked at uh, 20 cell lines, which are cells grown in test tubes taken from the tumors. Uh, and we've tested them for a number of things. We've looked for broken and rearranged chromosomes. We've looked for known mutations by, a, by looking for, for, the, for, for known mutations mutations with targeted sequencing uh, and we've also looked at the whole genome uh, for new mutations. Uh, and classical uh, tumor genetics uh, is often concentrated on, on, on mutations. So these are single changes in the DNA uh, which are brought on by, in this case, uh, the, the asbestos fibers that alter the code and cause uh, proteins uh, to be abnormal or not to be expressed at all. But equally important uh, are big changes in the DNA, where whole regions of, of DNA uh, can be cut out, uh, turned around back to front, or moved to other places, or sometimes duplicated, repeated again and again, or, uh, or replicated and, 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 and then uh, reinserted. Uh, and because of the feature of asbestos that this is what it does uh, to the genome we, we, we've concentrated on this this is not quite as complicated as it looks uh, here's the human genome these are all the chromosomes uh, uh, laid out as though they were in a single line uh, the, the blue bars are where there are regions of, of, of uh, deletion and then the red bars are, are regions where uh, there is duplication, where, where something has been cut out uh, and put back in. 
And this is a typical region uh, of uh, deletion. Indeed, this region is the most often uh, deleted region uh, uh, for many cancers, uh, but including mesothelioma. Uh, and this is, is a map of the different deletions in, 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 in all of the different subjects who, who, who were affected at this particular region, this locus. You can see a few people just had very narrow deletions, but for many patients, really quite big regions of loss. Why this is important is because here's this, uh, it's called an oncogene, CDKN2A, which drives cell cycle or controls the driving of the cell cycle. But right next door to it are these genes, which are called interferon genes, which have profound effects in immunity. They're, part of, they're an essential part of the body's response uh, to viral infections and indeed to, to, to other infections as well. And people have really not thought very much about uh, the interferon genes. So part of what we've done is bring attention now to the interferon genes. If you look at mesothelioma and compare it to lots of other cancers, uh, these are the number of mutations uh, in the genome. If you've got lung cancer, you've got hundreds to thousands of mutations uh, in your genome, and that's because of the nature of, of, of tobacco smoke. Uh, if you have mesothelioma, you have tens of mutations in your genome, tens to a hundred of mutations. So it's much less complicated uh, than, than many other tumors. Uh, and this is encouraging because it means it's much less of a puzzle, potentially, uh, to sort out what's going on and to find answers to it. This, this, this I don't expect you uh, to understand in any detail, but, but what it is, it lists chromosome regions down here, uh, these are all of the different patients across there. So each, 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 each bar is a different patient. Uh, and here uh, are all of the, the losses, uh, uh, patient by patient. Here are all of the gains, patient by patient. Uh, and here are mutations in the genes. And you can see that numerically, uh, the, the insertions and deletions are more important uh, than, than the genes. So the most common things affect, we found, four different pathways. Uh, and they're called the RB1 pathway, the hedgehog pathway, and the hippo pathway. And then there is a gene called BAP1. So please don't, don't, don't struggle uh, with, with the details of the pathway. Uh, the point is that the pathway is abnormal in 65% of, 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 of patients uh, who have the disease. Uh, and by recognizing that that pathway is involved, uh, it introduces new, new potential treatments. Uh, these are DNA damage checkpoint uh, inhibitors, polo-like kinase inhibitors, uh, and aurora kinase inhibitors. Uh, kinase inhibitors. Uh, these, I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, but these, these drugs are of intense interest in other tumors, but have not been yet used for mesothelioma. Uh, the next pathway is hedgehog. Hedgehog signaling uh, comes because the gene itself was discovered in fruit flies. And fruit flies uh, who had abnormalities uh, in, in the hedgehog genes uh, look like hedgehogs, it, it failed segmentation. Uh, the factors control in the pathway control cell growth, uh, and this also is, is abnormal in about 30% of tumors, uh, and we found that it also affects uh, immunity, and immunity is important because of immunotherapy. I'll talk a little about that in a minute. Then the last major pathway is called the HIPPO pathway. And here it again comes from fruit flies, and the fruit flies have mutations in this pathway. They get very big and they look like uh, hippos. Hippo pathway genes work at cell surfaces. So one cell signals to another and says, you're taking up enough space, stop growing. Uh, and uh, it, it determines organ size. Uh, and what's happening in mesothelioma is the hippo pathway is abnormal. Uh, and the cells keep growing. And this, we believe, is, is central to the fibrosis, uh, which is affecting the tumors. Another uh, 
very complicated slide. Uh, here, uh, we're taking each of the cell lines, so each of these six boxes is different cell lines, uh, and we're giving drugs to them, uh, suggested by uh, our, our studies, uh, in different doses, from very low doses to very high doses. For a drug to be useful in the clinic, it's got to be worth work at, uh, at least in the range of, of half a micromolar. And you can see just some of the drugs are cutting below the 50% line uh, at micromolar doses. Uh, and uh, this sort of summarizes it. The red ones are things which are likely to be uh, useful. So hedgehog may be useful some of the time. Hippo is likely to be useful most of the time. Uh, and the aurora kinase, PLK, check one inhibitors, uh, look as though they're very likely to, to, to be effective in the disease. That's orthodox sort of chemotherapy or new chemotherapy. Uh, immunotherapy is a very important part of treatment of all cancers. Uh, and in some patients with mesothelioma, uh, and, and this is a slide from uh, my colleague Sanjay Popat, who, who runs the big mesothelioma clinics, uh, at, at the Royal Marsden Hospital. Uh, and here you can see that uh, in a year, quite a lot of tumor has, 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 has disappeared. Uh, and, and for the patient, these, these are very dramatic responses. Unfortunately, these responses don't uh, persist. And so we're now looking for, for, for ways of prolonging those responses. So the take home message uh, is that there are one, two, three, four uh, new pathway, new drugs, uh, which are potentially of use uh, in mesothelioma. Some of them are relatively non-toxic. Some of them are, are routine use for other conditions. Uh, and by typing uh, for the mutations, we may be able to identify which patients are most likely to respond. Uh, for immunity, uh, I didn't have time, and uh, I think we would have tested your, your, your uh, concentration a little too hard to talk about the immunity. But we also have important leads uh, on how we can alter uh, the immune status to make immunotherapy uh, more active. And those missing interferon genes uh, are part of the picture. Uh, so that's it. Uh, it's not a finished story, but we think that we are making progress. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is the team. Uh, this is Miriam Moffat, who runs the group with me uh, and, uh, and, and, and takes most of uh, the decisions. These are some very uh, brilliant uh, postdocs uh, who, who work with us uh, and our more senior colleagues uh, on the right. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cookson. Uh, so just a couple of questions. It's very interesting, your talk. Um, how do you think the research undertaken at the moment will impact on those who are currently suffering with mesothelioma? The, uh, if, if, if we had enough money, uh, we, we would be doing tests. Uh, uh, we would be doing early stage clinical trials straight away. Uh, the, uh, and, uh, and as I say, many of these things are already in use. Uh, unfortunately, clinical trials cost a lot of money. Uh, and and we, the next stage for us in, in our funding cycle is, 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 is to persuade people to, uh, to support the clinical trials. I mean, there are, there are lots of other things that we want to do to understand what's going on in the tumors. But in terms of the, the bottom line so far, uh, uh, we, we believe that, that, that these compounds are likely to be effective in, in, a, in a proportion of the patients with mesothelioma. Thank you. Um, and what is the importance of genetics in mesothelioma care? So how can it help with treatment and determining treatment? That's a, that's a very uh, good question. Uh, the, the hope with, with, with cancers in general, and, and indeed with mesothelioma, is, is that, that you get tailored treatment. And, and, and so by looking at the tumors, saying this patient has lost all of their interferon genes, or, or this patient uh, has, has got a hedgehog mutation, then you would treat them differently according to what mutations they have. It's quite 
straightforward, uh, now we know what the main mutations are, uh, to test for those with, you know, quite, quite, uh, quite simple tests that, that just take uh, a, a few days for, on a piece of tumor. So we can say what the, the, the tumor mutations are and then tailor therapy according to it. Okay, that sounds really positive. Um, can genetics explain why everyone who is exposed to asbestos doesn't develop mesothelioma? Because we know that not everyone who's exposed does go on to develop mesothelioma. Again, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, people have looked uh, uh, and have not found anything uh, very clear cut that, 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 that determines risk or not. Um, but the kind of studies that you need to do to answer those questions involve thousands and thousands of patients, so I don't think they've been done properly. But there is no smoking gun, you know, there's no big uh, genetic effect uh, that's going to uh, predispose some people and not others. I'll just, uh, the, the, there are very rare inherited cancer syndromes, uh, which also predispose to, 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 to breast cancer. So there's uh, the, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, uh, and mutations in, in, in genes also to do with DNA repair. Uh, and people who carry those mutations can get mesothelioma without exposure to asbestos. Uh, and the mesothelioma occurs at a much, uh, can occur at a much younger age. Uh, there it's, it's very important to recognize patients who do have those so-called germline mutations. Uh, it's so that you can watch them closely, uh, intervene far more earlier than would be possible and also advise them about risk to their family of, of the other cancers as well as mesothelioma. Okay, that's really useful. Thank you ever so much for your talk. I, I personally found it very informative and I'm sure that a lot of our viewers would have done as thank well. You. So thank you very much, Professor Gibson. Good, thank you very much indeed.